welcome to the first session of Human Nature and the Technical Object by Cecile Malaspina. The question of man's place in nature today presents itself in the stark opposition between nature and technology. Locked in the end game of an asymmetrical antagonism, technology is seen as threatening the viability of biodiversity on Earth raising dystopian visions of the obliteration of human life on Earth and consequently of the recovery or ultimate victory of an indifferent cosmos. In this one credit seminar, we will revisit the notions of nature and human nature through a reading of Gilbert Simondon on the mode of existence of technical objects. We will distinguish at least three nuances in his conceptualization of nature in a structural sense as a regime of elements in a functional sense, as what lends itself to individuation, in a more fundamental metaphysical sense, as the unlimited, the formless, or infinite apparel. This will enable us to discern surprises in Simondon's understanding of the nature of things according to their, their essence, which implies a startling understanding of human nature. In this seminar, we will broach Simondon's richly fasted uh, conceptualization of nature as one that is not based on dichotomies between the natural and the artificial or between the human and the other species, implying an ethics that abhors the mythical inclination towards technocracy, if anything, as a misunderstanding of technical essence or of the nature of technicity. Cecil Malaspina is the author of An Epistemology of Noise and principal translator of Gil uh, Gilbert Simondon's On the Mound of Existence of Technical Objects, with the collaboration of John Rogovic. She's uh, director of the program at the Collège International de Philosophie, Paris, where she's also a member of the executive board. She's visiting fellow of King's College London, where her program for the uh, CIF is hosted by the departments of digital humanities and the department of French, in association with the Center for Art and Philosophy. She's a member of the editorial boards of the CIF's book series at the Presse de Paris Inter, and of this of its journal of philosophy called the cat where she has recently become co-responsible for the epistemology section as well as being contributing editor for angelic journal of the theoretical humanities commission and editor for the independent publisher copy press and guest, guest editor at nature humanities and social science communications cecil malaspina obtained her doctorate in epistemology philosophy and history of the science and technology from uh, Paris 7, Denis de Dereau, and her master's in contemporary French philosophy and critical theory from the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy in the UK. Before turning to philosophy, she trained as an artist, art historian, and curator. Her main, in her main interest lies in the normativity of concepts, especially with regard to the aesthetic and ethical implications of conceptualizing contingency and uncertainty. Okay, so Cecilia, you can go on. Thank you very much for the introduction. Just for the record, because this is being recorded, I'm uh, a few of the things are no longer the case from the short uh, bio. I'm still a member of the Collège International de Philosophie, but um, after the we have a kind of turnover, so I'm not no longer a member of the editorial board or um, executive board. There's a new cohort of. Um, <clears throat> program directors who join every three years and so we have a kind of turnover in this and there was something else yes I think um, my fellowship at King's College is something that is um, has come to an end and might be renewed but anyway I'm just saying that for the record in case it sounds like I'm you know pluming myself with with things that are no longer the case okay so I have uh, thought it useful, before we jump right in with Simon Don, um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have questions if you've had time to read some of the texts. Um, Simon Don is a very difficult philosopher, very rewarding, but a very difficult philosopher to read. Um, so I decided to do some preliminaries with you and go back, if you like, to um, something that might not look very contemporary, but I think you're going to find that some of the blueprints for things that we think are new ideas actually go back a, a, quite a long way. So I've prepared a kind of preliminary mapping of some of the fundamental concepts uh, and attitudes surrounding nature and uh, the concept of techne or the arts um, since antiquity. 
not with the purpose of saying um, all the modern concepts should be brought back to a kind of etymological root where you find the authenticity or the true meaning of it, not at all. And uh, with Simondon, you'll find, and I think even with respect to my own reading of Simondon, that it's not so much a question of continuity necessarily as one of intervention, of, of really, you know, rejigging things and putting things in a, in a different light. Um, and also just uh, straightforward disagreeing with things. Although you might find um, very often that the deeper you dig with philosophical concepts, the more subtle the nuance becomes to the point that you you might have the impression that you're saying something completely plain and obvious. And it's only when the consequences of that fully unfold, you realize that it kind of develops a cosmos of thought or a kind of coherent system of thought that is actually incompatible with another one. So all these subtle nuances at right at the in the boiler room, if you like, of, of the way we think about the world, they generate different visions of the world. Often we don't realize that they are completely incompatible and we kind of um, surf between different models without realizing that they are incongruous. And in fact, it's not a big problem that they're incongruous unless you're an engineer and you come up with systems that don't actually work together. So that's my own background, my interest in noise and indeterminacy um, in an, um, a form of negativity that I've discussed with some of you already in, a, in the a Great Refusal Seminar. Mm, has something to do with the fact that it's okay to have ideas that don't line up seamlessly. We can work with margins, and, margins of uncertainty. Anyway, this is a different topic. So I'm going to use a PowerPoint. And do, you can interrupt me, by the way, if you have a question, if you want me to repeat a name or something like that. Um, today is just going to be very easy and steady. we will take one idea, one notion, one concept at a time. And then next time I'm going to read um, a paper that is the basis of this seminar. And that's going to be a little bit dense and, and a bit faster than what we do today. But I think on the basis of what we do today, next session is going to be much more um, rewarding, hopefully. Oh, wait, I just clicked on my PowerPoint without sharing the screen. Okay. Good. Okay, human nature and the technical object. A reading of Simondon. So I can you see the full page? Because for me it's kind of uh, snipped off the yes. face of Simondon. Is it yes. visible to you? Yes. yes. I am. Okay. I can see. Yes, it is. Okie dokie. So, because I, I kind of, I don't like PowerPoint, so I tried to make very beautiful slides. But you'll see that towards the end of the PowerPoint, I kind of ran out of time and just <laughs> put text boxes in there. So this is a portrait of the young uh, Simondon, and the quote that really I think is quite phenomenal, right? and profound and around which I'm going to structure this seminar and, and around which is structured the, um, the paper that I'm going to read for you next in the next session is this quote, there is something of human nature in the technical being. In the sense that this word nature could be used to designate the remainder of what is original prior even to the humanity that constitutes man. Man invents by putting to work his own natural material. This aperon, so the concept of aperon is the unlimited and the indefinite, the infinite also. This aperon, which remains attached to each individual being. So I'll read that again, because just so that it kind of really sinks in, because there's um, massive concepts colliding in a way that's really quite um, inhabitual, I think. So there is something of human nature in the technical being, in the sense that this word nature could be used to designate the remainder of what is original prior even to the humanity that constitutes man. 
So if you like, uh, human nature refers to something that is prior to what is human in man. Um, so prior even to, to the humanity that constitutes man, man invents by putting to work his own natural material, this aperon, which remains attached to each individual being. So perhaps just for context, um, this notion of individuation, which is quite difficult to wrap one's head around and around which Simodon constructs his entire oeuvre. So he wrote two um, main theses as is uh, customary in France. So if any of you are in the process of writing a PhD and you're despairing, just think of the poor French who actually have to write two theses and you're like, okay, you know, you don't have to go through this hell twice, just once. So he wrote two theses. Uh, the one, the main thesis is called uh, individuation in light of the notions of form. Individuation à la lumière des notions de forme et de potentiel in the light of the notion of form and potential, um, which has been finally translated by Taylor Atkins. And uh, the other main thesis, which was called um, on the mode of existence of technical objects, um, which I translated together with John Rogoff, or yeah, together with John Rogoff. So in this uh, primary thesis, what he's doing is something really unusual and clever, which is he rehabilitates the notion of individuation. The idea that if you look at an individual, um, I suppose you could say in, in this uh, kind of gradient of how individual you can be and what can be an individual. Uh, rather than saying, for example, all things are made up of atoms, which are the primary individuals in the sense that they are non-dividable, indivisible, and like Leibniz uh, or like the um, atomists would say, the, the, the pre-Socratic atomists, or on the other hand, to say that everything is one. As Spinoza would uh, would consider nature, for example, to be the real individual and everything else in it are, are, is only a partial or relative um, transitory individual that has a kind of lesser significance. So Simon Don does something, I think, really quite profound, which is on the one hand to reestablish the value of the no notion of the individual, um, something that I think is both important for us to consider in its complexity now that we are kind of stuck between a liberal concept of the individual or kind of pure individualism on the one hand, and um, I think sometimes a tendency to deny the individual in favor of a kind of um, collective or, or trans species vision that, that would kind of efface the specificity and um, particularity of the individual. So he reestablishes this concept of the individual not as something that um, pre-exists not as a compound or not as a whole within which we are fragments, but as something that has a dignity in its own right. And he's going to account for the process of not only the genesis of the individual, the way that an apple tree produces apples, but also, and this is something often underestimated, he rehabilitates a debate that has basically been shut down by the earliest um, glimmering lights of modern science in the high, high middle ages, namely the, the problem of individuation. What is the principle of individuation? So what is the principle of individuation? Is how does something become a here, this, now, in a way that is irre, irreplaceable or rather non-transferable? So every triangle of the same specifications is absolutely identical to every other triangle. But if you make a triangle that you have, or you have one in front of you, it is an individual in the sense that no other individual triangle occupies this moment in space and time, or is made of exactly this material or in exactly those dynamic conditions. And the question then is, what is it exactly that makes an individual an individual in this sense of singularity or um, Don Scotus would dis discover or invent really this concept of hexeity? Because there really wasn't a way to say what is singular in this way, because all the things we can say about an individual are actually universals, are things that we can say of other individuals too. So this is a really interesting um, sticky point in the history of thought, and one that uh, in an in interesting way, Simondon 
rehabilitates to think about the individual and the process of individuation, which, as I said, is not just ontogenesis, not how do things come about, but also how is something a this here now a kind of singularity. So that's the first. Now, how do I go to the next? Here we go. His two supervisors, main supervisors, were um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And I'm not going to dive too deep in it. I'm just going to give you a quote as a kind of flavor of his two supervisors. One is Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The other one is Georges Conguilhem. And I'm more of a Conguilhem reader than I was of Merleau-Ponty, although I think uh, Merleau-Ponty is a very um, underrated, and it's, I guess he ought to be read much more and um, more thoroughly. So here's a quote about nature from Merleau-Ponty from his book, Phenomenology of Perception. And he says, freedom, and this is a kind of contracted version. I've, I've got the bigger one in the notes here. I don't know how to make the notes visible to myself. Freedom is the nature of consciousness, which consists in having no nature. So if you're a bit confused now, if we're trying to define what nature is, um, I think that's completely okay. But we're talking about the nature of something in terms of its substantial essence or its specific difference. Um, so what, what is the specific difference of freedom or human freedom? Um, it is that it has no specificity. It's not preordained. It's not subject to necessity. It doesn't have to be in a specific way necessarily. So freedom is the nature of consciousness, which consists in having no nature. So I think this is quite an interesting quote. If we're going to discuss the tension and relation between nature and technology, because in this freedom um, to invent, to be ingenuous, and to, um, if you like, outgrow through our intelligence what are our um, what is our natural condition you kind of enter into this paradigm of um, the nature of something that consists in having no nature. And if you, if you like, I'm going to link this eventually in the discussions at the end of our seminar to this idea of the apeiron. And just to give you kind of, um, just to, so you know perhaps where I'm coming from, although this is not something we're discussing here in this seminar, I'm um, working on the concept of noise a lot. And uh, what interests me is this um, absence of determination if you like, in the sense of the apeiron. So where do I find the notes here? Then I can read you the full quote. If I click on this, it's going to expand. Mm, does anyone know? How do you see the notes? Next, please. Okay. Does it, has any one of you had enough experience? Because usually I don't use the notes. Thingy. Um, you can, um, with those uh, last menu you open, you could just open present view. Um, you'll see the option to use present view. Uh, where you just opened up the three dots. Ah, yes. Uh, use present view should do it for. Ah, nice. Thank you very much. Aha, amazing. The only thing is that even we can see your notes now. It doesn't matter. There's nothing. Okay. No state secrets in there, I hope. Okay. <laughs> So if the, thank you very much for that, because I'm um, kind of a reluctant PowerPoint user. It always makes me think of business presentations. So the longer quote reads like this. If the slave displays freedom as much by living in fear as by breaking his chains, then it cannot be held that there is such a thing as a free action because freedom is anterior to all actions. So the freedom to either break your chains or remain in an enslaved um, condition. So if this freedom is anterior to this decision, then um, there is no such thing as a free action in itself because freedom is anterior to all actions. Freedom has become a primordial acquisition just prior to everything else. And as it were, our state of nature. Since we do not have to provide it, this freedom, it is the gift granted to us of having no gift. It is the gift granted to us of having no gift or no um, 
kind of determining predisposition or instinct or um, necessary way of acting. The gift granted to us of having no gift, it is the nature of consciousness which consists in having no nature. So you have this kind of anomaly right at the center of the concept of nature, which I think is, is quite fascinating and is something that we're going to see uh, already animated kind of centuries of discussion around nature. Is nature what is uh, purely um, bound by necessity and hence acting in a purely mechanical way? And then how do you make the difference between a purely mechanical object that is not nature according to this idea of, of fusis or genesis or birth or dynamism of life. And so we, we'll get into the nitty gritty of that in a second. So the second is uh, Georges Canguilhem, uh, um, not very well known in the Anglo-Saxon world. And I don't know how well known or not he is in um, other parts of the world. I'd love to hear that from you guys. If you'd heard about Georges Canguilhem, he was a really seminal figure, one of the most important philosophers of the mid 20th century in France. And not that well known, but through his role as inspecteur général, so he had his fingers in every pie, uh, he was deciding who was going to be a professor where, and, um, and not only through his institutional role, but he also wrote notably, I mean, one book in particular called The Normal and the Pathological, which was reissued, I think it was uh, first published in the 1940s and then reissued in 1965 with a preface by um, uh, Foucault. And Foucault makes it very clear in this preface that, that Conguilhem has been, um, has marked, profoundly marked all of the French philosophers of that time that we now uh, refer to more um, readily, de, from Deleuze to um, Foucault to... I can't, I can't even name them all, but he, he was a really significant figure. And the other reason why he's significant is that when we speak of continental philosophy or um, French philosophy, the idea from an Anglo-Saxon point of view, I'm only saying Anglo-Saxon because I live in, in the United Kingdom and I'm kind of um, living on in a disparity between these philosophical worlds, worlds, yeah, worlds. And I think this is true for many other people, but I don't know what it's like. I don't know what philosophy people read in India or in Argentina. The idea though, is that um, when we say continent philosophy, we think of phenomenology, a phenomenology that comes from Husserl and Heidegger. And Conguilhem very much imprinted his thought on a generation of thinkers that were very critical of phenomenology. And in particular, on a branch of the philosophy of science or French epistemology that was fundamentally critical of um, phenomenology. So this, I think, is something to, to bear in mind and to know and to come back to. And he's a superb philosopher. I mean, he has a way of, of being specific. Of he, he mostly wrote on medicine and biology, but everything he wrote, in a way, had this potential to be uh, extrapolated for thinking about uh, the world at large, about politics, about ethics. And yet he had this discipline of, of staying close to his topic. He's a really fantastic thinker, I think. So he says uh, in uh, Thought and the Living, a text uh, republished in The Knowledge of Life, one enjoys not the laws of nature, but nature itself, not numbers, but qualities, not relations, but beings. And all told, one does not live off knowledge. Is this vulgar? Perhaps. Is it blasphemous in philosophy, if you like? But why? Must we believe that because certain men dedicate themselves to a life of knowledge, man can only really live in and through science? So he had this way of really, he trained as a doctor, by the way, as a medical doctor, um, first as a philosopher, then he trained as a doctor. Um, and he trained as a doctor, not in order to become a doctor or exercise. And he, he did briefly in the resistance, I think, um, look after people in the kind of battlefield. But um, because he thought that philosophy really had to get its teeth into a particular subject and not be kind of aloof and speculate about the world at large or moralize. So he was quite critical of um, 
existentialists, for instance, who didn't go into the resistance, but kind of taught under the um, fascist collaboration and kind of just, you know, said very revolutionary things, but didn't behave in a way that actually changed things. So I'll just read that again. One enjoys not the laws of nature, but nature itself. Not numbers, but qualities. Not relations, but beings. And all told, one does not live off knowledge. Vulgar, perhaps. Blasphemous, but why? Must we believe that because certain men dedicate themselves to a life of knowledge, man can only really live in and through the science in and through science. The other thing I might mention is that he grew up in the countryside in France and he decided never to, he, obviously he, he, his career was in Paris and he decided never to let go of his uh, dialect or accent from the south of France, which is something that um, in this kind of very bourgeois intellectual milieu in Paris would have um, attracted ridicule in, in that time, probably still today. In fact, certainly still today, because I used to have a similar accent to his, because I, I had family from the south of France. And when I met people from Paris, they would kind of repeat the words I say and laugh. And I don't know if it was the, my German accent mixed with this southern dialect. But so I think that's quite interesting about him, because there's, on the one hand, a great discipline in his philosophy. On the other hand, this um, slightly punk attitude to say okay I've got my accent I keep my accent I'm not bourgeois I'm not going to pretend he came from a family of farmers he grew up with I think his uh, father or his grandfather was um forestier uh what do you call that in English someone who looks after the forests so this idea of being you know rooted in nature and experiencing nature before knowledge all the knowledge was very important for him um, is uh, clearly comes out very strongly here and it anticipates, the reason I brought this in here was that it anticipates or rather amplifies something that is there in the concept of nature right from the start in its relation with techni or technology or technicity, uh, namely the relation to uh, knowledge in science or episteme. And you know, having become an epistemologist is kind of significant that he makes a statement like this. So now <clears throat> a few basic preliminaries. Obviously, I'm not exhaustively covering the history of the concept of, of technique, technology, because that, that would take many, many seminars, but I just kind of grabbed a few, um, a few bites left, right, and center across the history of this term. Um, noting perhaps that the French are quite particular in uh, distinguishing uh, a technique or techniques from technology in the sense that uh, techne and logos is the science of techne, which is not the same as um, is the knowledge of techne, the, the technology, rather than the way that we understand it. When we say technology, we think about uh, objects, things, um, digital ne networks, and so forth. So here we go into the concept of technology. And um, in this dictionary of Greek terms of philosophy, which isn't actually a very good dictionary, but it was interesting that it put it like this. It said, techne is an activity that rather than bowing to the laws of nature allows man to act according to his own nature. So if you like, that's um, something that would be totally blown into a million pieces by a quote like that of Merleau-Ponty. So it's almost the opposite of what Merleau-Ponty says. Activity, but well, I mean, depends how you um, how you come down on the concept of the nat of human nature or the nature of man, and that's what we'll see with in the in the next session. But activity, rather than bowing to the laws of nature, allows man to act according to his own nature. What's already presumed in this, and that's not at all um, the case throughout the history of philosophy, is that nature is necessarily bound by laws that would be kind of immutable. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, first little abide. Um, Tecne is translated into the Latin as ars, is not a joke, um, or the arts. And in a much better um, dictionary, which is, uh, I didn't put that in here actually, Art of the Ancients, I think. I don't know, but I have five dictionaries here and I forgot which one I took this out of. 
Um, anyway, so long. I know this is from the Dictionary of Untranslatables, which was edited by Barbara Cassin. So long as people thought with Latin or in, in Latin, art and technique were one and the same things, says Francis Goyer. So he wrote this entry into the dictionary. And the Latin ars comes from the root er, which provides in particular the Greek um, arthron. So I think they've, I've copied it as it was written in the dictionary, but it's, it, I think they mean something like the Latin ars comes from the root er, which is a compound of the Greek word arthron or articulation, which you find again in the Latin armus or upper arm, so the articulation of, of the body as well. It also appears in the Latin word ritus or right and the Greek arithmos, the number. So articulation, if you like, both of numbers, of events uh, and of um, items that are put together in a way such that they can function together is equal to the Greek word techne, which has the root tex from construct or make. Now in the, um, throughout the Latin, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, in the kind of Christian Latin philosophy, uh, Aristotle was, uh, the Arabic translations of Aristotle were finally being retranslated uh, or rebrought into circulation in European philosophy from where they had kind of vanished for a few hundred years. And um, this reading of Aristotle entrenched this idea of the, the division of the prime arts or techniques, which is the trivium on the one hand, cons constituted by grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And on the other hand, the quadrivium, which is constituted of uh, arithmetics, music, geometry, and astronomy. And um, there's the other distinction that these form the liberal arts in the sense that uh, they are the arts or techniques practiced by free men, as or by, I, I would say it's kind of irksome. When you read a lot of French philosophy, this idea of the human as a, as a male is, is so present in the language it kind of there's nothing I can do about it, but I just want to signal that this is not me who expresses myself freely like this. I'm just kind of reflecting the language that is being used. So the liberal arts are practiced by free men as opposed to the servile arts, which are practiced by slaved, slaves and women. But what, for instance, about architecture, medicine, and law? So there were clearly other uh, disciplines that were being established and also taught in the medieval universities, but that was a kind of gradual complexification of this um, fundamental notion of, of what are the most fundamental arts or techniques. And the reason why I think it's very important to mention this is that when we speak about technology today, not only do we um, underestimate this relation between logos and techne, the idea that um, we're talking about things, but we're actually designating them by the signs of how these things are in the world, namely artificial. And on the other hand, we think of new technologies as kind of electrical gadgets or super planetary systems. But fundamentally, what I want to what I want to go back to is that there is a logic and grammar. And if you think of social networks, for instance, and their um, basis in technology, also rhetoric, also a sense in the which in which um, persuasion plays a role in how certain technologies today are um, distributed throughout the world and used. I think if we think about algorithms, for instance, there's obviously logic, there's a form of grammar in the way that they operate and th their effect or the insertion in the world is certainly something that has a, um, that couldn't be thought really without the art or techne or technique of uh, rhetorics. So next. So one fundamental imprint on the entire history of thought about techni, technology in the, in the crafts is actually um, um, an idea that makes it very difficult to distinguish art and technology. And that comes, that goes back to Plato and to his um, Timaeus, which was a dialogue in which he speculated about the origin of the world. And here's a quote from the Timaeus. He says, 
The craftsman of this universe then took as his model that which is grasped by reason and intelligence and is consistent. End of quote. So there's the idea uh, of uh, the demiurge or the craftsman who devises the world and who kind of um, brings order into a chaotic cosmos and, and makes everything cohere, makes all the spheres cohere. Um, the cosmic sphere, uh, the atmosphere, the, um, the terrestrial uh, entities, animals, humans, plants, and so forth. Everything kind of coheres and, and forms um, a rational system, ultimately, because it's been devised um, by this craftsman or demiurge, who himself cleans the intelligence of the cosmos in their kind of eternal, in its kind of eternal truth or blueprint on its rationality. So in accordance with the likely account, we must declare, oh, this is another quote, I've got the quotation marks. This is also from the, the Timaeus. Thus, then, in accordance with the likely account, we must declare that this cosmos has verily come into existence as a living creature endowed with a soul and reason. Anima is the, is the breath that animates so even the entire cosmos not only what what we would now consider to be inanimate um, bodies they are also animate the, the entire cosmos has a soul and is animate in the very basic sense that it is in movement so the living creature endowed with soul and reason a living creature one and visible containing within itself all the living creatures which are by nature akin to itself or coherent with it. So this idea of the world soul, and this is kind of um, illustration in the background, is something that that's going to have a massive career throughout the history of philosophy. And I think you also find it in the concept of Gaia today, or the idea when we say we need to save nature, we're referring to something like that. We're, we're referring to the totality of all entities that we subsume under the concept of nature as something that is not only a collection of individuals, but that is itself an individual endowed with a kind of uh, overarching rationality and soul or anima, or that it has an animation that is systematic, that comprises everything that is within it. And although this is a theological and speculative um, myth, if you like, the Timaeus, it has a really deep um, repercussion throughout the history of philosophy, also into um, very rationalist philosophies like Spinoza um, and Leibniz, uh, Schelling and Hegel, for example. Hegel uses this concept of the Weltgeist. So the question is, what would be the contemporary figures of that? To what extent do we think about um, the climate the unfolding kind of climate crisis in terms that still rely on this notion of the world soul. And if we do, to what extent does this vision still incorporate something like a kind of ingeniousness of how this all works? So that's that would be an impersonal way of saying what sounds a bit daft and outdated, the idea of the demiurge or, or the... Um, the craftsman who, who crafts the coherent cosmos. But I, I think that in a, in a impersonal way, this, this figure of how ingenious nature is in fitting things together is still very much a, a thought that is alive today. I mean, I, I'd love to hear what you think about that. And so I'll go to the next. So just again, to as I've already mentioned with the trivium and the quadrivium, what is very important to me when we think about contemporary technologies or, or planetary computation is to reconnect this idea of techne to the fundamental um, articulation of different techniques. So that it's not, it's been something that, um, techne is something that Plato connected, for example, with statementship right from the start. And if we think today, for example, about um, uh, algorithmic governmentality, it sounds very abstract, but if you bring it back to the idea of techne as statesmanship, I, I think you find that there is a strange kind of 
I continued is a strong word, but I think there are concepts that um, ought to be placed back at the center of um, discourse about technologies, contemporary technologies or modern technologies. So in the Statesman, there's a visitor, the Eleatic visitor, who says, just as before, we gave the name of statesmanship to the sort of expertise that especially had a charge of the state. So too now shall we call this sort the art of clothes making from the thing itself. And shall we say that weaving too, insofar as it represented the largest part of the manufacture of clothes, does not differ at all, at all, except in name from this art of clothes making. Just as in that other case, we said that the art of kingship did not differ from that of statesmanship. So there's this idea that, that when we think about technology, we have to kind of go one step back and think about technique. What are the techniques? What are its applications? What does it mean that these things have something in common, statesmanship and weaving and clothes making and, uh, and even kingship? So another um, important idea that comes from Plato and that is very much alive today, for example, around the idea of replacing proteins with um, synthetic proteins, is this idea that art imitates nature. So what, is, what does he mean by this, Plato? is actually kind of interesting because it's not just the idea that you paint a painting of a vase or of a flower or of a, or of a landscape and that you're simply imitating it like this, in, in which case um, this would have very little import, for example, for artistic pro production today. But if we go a little bit deeper into this idea of imitation, what we have, Plato in the Republic condemns art, the, art, the notion of art or technique. I, I put them with a slash so that we, we keep this um, polysemy together. Uh, so he condemns art or techne, for example, in the in the great poets, in Homer and Hesiod, as an imitation of nature, as just storytelling, telling basically. But also, but also nature is itself already an imitation, an imitation of eternal ideas in Plato. So the phenomenon, the phenomena around ourselves are not um, are not kind of. Uh, indicative of authenticity they they merely lead us to the eternal ideas because they're transient phenomena they change they're regular um but the archetypes of them the fact that when we see i don't know a duck's hound and a siberian husky we still know that both of them are a, are a, a dog this is because there is this archetype of the idea of the dog that then has this variation of um iterations in experience so you have a, a, an image, what is really um, to be condemned is that because Plato seeks through the mere appearance of things to come to the true and eternal ideas that underpin them or to their truth or their true natures, um, really go, going a step back and making an imitation of an imitation uh, is kind of counterproductive for him. And uh, it's therefore, it's also something that really shouldn't have an important role in statesmanship, for example, because it's, it's just something that removes you further from the truth. So also nature is an imitation, namely an imitation of eternal ideas. And Plato distinguishes art, art is imitation of an imitation, mimetusa, and mimesis phantasmatos. I'm sorry if there's any Greek among you who feel offended by my pronunciation, but that's the best I can do. From the artisan's fabrication, poietusa, of something after an eternal idea. For example, the carpenter makes a bed after the eternal idea of a bed, which I think is actually a really daft example. Um, anyway, it's it's this is the idea that you have you have a further degree of distance between yourself and the eternal ideas when you merely um, copy things. But uh, he opposes art and techna also to inspiration, thea dunamis. So as opposed to Homer or Hesiod, who um, invent myths and tell stories and basically bamboozle you, Socrates wrote a poem that was inspired by the divine order. And that's, that's a kind of different thing. So through inspiration, you can 
use techne or art to come closer to truth. He also calls it uh, techne. He calls techne a virtue allied to science, episteme, because techne is an application of general knowledge to particular cases. So the doctor, for instance, as opposed to the, you know, um, grandmother's remedies at home, the doctor has a kind of uses knowledge and uh, universal principles and um, general principles and applies it to, you know, the variety of individual cases and the pilot or the Kubernetes also. So what do we have next? I've just checked in. I can't see. Um, do you know what the time is? Because I'm, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Right now, and I can't, I don't want to escape here. Yes. Are we okay? Oh, oh yeah, I see. Uh, you know, I see the time up there. So it's 27 minutes. It's actually good. I'm discovering this presenter's mode is actually quite good. So, again, a really interesting for um, contemporary thinking about technology, planetary computation, um, digitization, and so forth, is that the canonical example in ancient Greek philosophy for technology was the ship's pilot or the Kubernetes. The, <clears throat> uh, Kubernetes is the term that is at the basis of what we later call cybernetics or the science or computer science. Um, that's a different history that I can't get into this time, but I, I think it's something to be borne in mind. So the sea is more powerful than he is, and it is far from being perfectly predictable. So in the sense that tech, the techne is something that is um, grappling with the contingent, with what is unpredictable, as opposed to science, which deals with eternal principles or uh, kind of general universal principles that are not subject to contingency. Laws of nature don't change from one day to the next, but the Kubernetes or the, the helmsman, the cybernetician, if you like, has to always grapple with what is contingent. So I'm going to show you a little uh, clip here from uh, the Antikythera mechanism. I don't know if any of you are aware of this amazing program that Benjamin Bratton has put together around this idea of the Antikythera, which was a kind of astronomical a device uh, invented uh, in ancient Greece to um, that obviously also helped navigation that that helped understand um, the astronomy. I'll click on this. Okay, that doesn't work. Let me just go here. Can you still see my my screen in general or okay. yes yes good right no i it's a pity that this link doesn't work right Ah, wrong. Sorry. Why does this link not work? Okay, I'm just going to have to skip this unless I find it right. No, I think I, I closed it earlier. What? It's a real shame that this link doesn't work. Hmm. Nothing I can do. Ah, here we go, actually. Okay, well, this is definitely not meant to happen then. I mean, look it up. This is a paper in uh, Nature. Put it here so you can see it better. On the Antikythera object which has been basically reconstructed and put together again. So the paper is called um, 
<clears throat> a model of the cosmos in the ancient Greek Antikythera mechanism. That is, irks me. It's a shame. Okay. This was just, just I, I would have liked to show you this so that the idea of this helmsman isn't um isn't too primitive in your minds. That there was already quite a sophisticated um combination of um calculations and craftsmanship and um technology of navigation and astronomy, kind of imbricated knowledge and technique imbricated one in the other. So technical art moves in the domain of the contingent of what might be other than what it is. This is an article by Francis Guayer. I think it's from the uh, Dictionary of Untranslatables. <clears throat> technical art moves in the domain of the contingent of what might be other than what it is. And this character is not peculiar to it. The contingent is also the domain of prudence, phonesis which is, so to speak, the production of actions in Greek praxis. Technical art and prudence are thus opposed to the intellectual virtues, such as science or episteme, which seek to know the necessary, for example, in astronomy. I, I was going to write it differently opposed, but it's, I mean, if you quote, you can't really change people's quotes, but... It's clearly wrong to say that they're opposed because it's not that you use one or the other, but they are imbricated one in the other, but they have a kind of specific difference. I look at, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, Cecile, very quick. Um, isn't one of the principles of uh, contingency, at least uh, this Masonian hyperchaos, as well that contingency can lead towards the states where everything stays the same as well. And then that what might be other than what it is, would this be understood as um, something that necessarily needs to, to change or that it can also lead to our system staying the same or? Uh... Like in, uh, in which context were you saying that you're thinking of the concept of entropy or something like this? So technical, uh, this quote, technical art moves in the domain of the, of the contingent of what might be other than what it is. Does this necessarily introduces change or novelty as uh, something which equals, or at least, is it this how they understand contingent? I know. I think what uh, what is meant is is a bit more basic in the sense that as a doctor, you deal with a variety of individuals who have a variety of degrees of good health. But as a as a uh, in terms of epistemology, the ideal or the archetype of a healthy body would always be the same. So that would be the realm of necessity, whereas you in your technique or your art of um, your craftsmanship, your craft as a as a medic or as a helmsman uh, or in the navigation of ships, for example, is that of countering the contingent, that which is um, contingent to in in so far as you are concerned, because you cannot predict what's going to happen next. It doesn't mean that that what what's happening around you is not itself subject to the laws of nature, or depending on the paradigm in which you think about it, um, kind of bound by necessity. But in so far as you're navigating it, you're navigating in uncertainty or darkness. And to counter this, you use you use the you the device or the and the skill and, and the art and the technique that kind of brings order into what is experienced as unpredictable and contingent. So very much this is um, very much in line with the idea of uh, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics and negentropy, the idea that, that you use machines to kind of counter the chaotic um, tendency of uh, yeah. entities or systems to kind of uh, disintegrate and um, malfunction. So the, yeah, that, that's uh, in that sense, also the idea of uh, being opposed to phonesis is wrong because phonesis or prudence is, is very much the partner of technia. 
Ponensis and action and praxis and technique cannot really be thought one without the other because in order to act prudently, you need to be, you need to have a way of acting that is um, systematic and reproducible. So that the way you build a ship, you don't invent it every time you build a ship. You have a you have a technique, you have a knowledge of how to build a ship. Um, I don't know, for example, I, I had a bee in my bonnet to make a pizza like an Italian, and I, I was so into the idea and I got the different mixtures of flowers and, and different types of water and the different um, temperature of the oven and I made the most amazing pizza you have ever seen in this world but I didn't write it down and I couldn't reproduce it so it was a kind of intuitive way of, of you know doing something but it's not a technique whereas a chef learns all the fundamental principles of combustion and ovens or whatever the, the chemical properties of the flowers that they use perhaps even um so this is the difference between you know techne being something that is, is systematic and reproducible and also generalized so your technique is not different from somebody else's technique if you're a violinist you might play the violin differently but you learn a technique to play the violin that is the technique of everybody else more or less so it doesn't exclude singularity, but there's this emphasis on uh, reproducible, both in technique that would be used within the arts, with what we within what we now call the arts or kind of aesthetics, and within um, you know practical techniques like being a doctor or a lawyer or an architect, and also when you make things. So for those of you who have been um, during the seminar on uh, the last one, Techne and Monoculture, I didn't really bring this into the discussion so much, but there was a strong um, pushback against the idea of standardization. And I, am, I was surprised in a way by this because I think there is no technique. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, there is no form of technique that doesn't rely on forms of standardization. Otherwise it's a kind of, uh, improvise is a form of improv even improvisation to be honest I think relies a lot on techniques I don't even know what doesn't but certainly something that isn't systematic and cannot be collectively applied wouldn't necessarily tend towards standardization anyway this is a regression for those of you who were there um, in the techno monoculture seminar so art moves in the domain of the contingent so what is this about this is um, also for me personally very important when you think about the concept of noise um, that it isn't so much a question of what the world is, but of the fact that you have to act in um, within uncertainty. You don't know what the outcome is. So the ingenuity of your approach to the world is one that can handle uncertainty. Um, so this was very much still um, Plato. Now, Aristotle kind of develops this idea of, of technique, techne further, and uh, moves away from this Timaeus idea of a kind of proto-theological religious um, idea of the creation of the world to something that is much more empirical and much more a kind of first attempt at a systematization of a systematic observation of the natural world in, in this sense of uh, Fusis as physics, but we'll get to the nature and forces and physics, but in, in a second, it's it's this slide here. So for Aristotle, likewise, this I included this um, uh, quote about rhetorics because I think this is extremely highly important when you think about technology today and especially social uh, social media and information technologies. Rhetoric, he says, may be defined as the faculty of observing, in any given case, the available means of persuasion. This is not a function of any other art. So there's a technique, and it, from today's point of view, I think you could talk about rhetorics as a technology too, uh, especially if you think about it in terms of algorithms. So every other art can instruct or persuade about its own particular subject matter. For instance, medicine about what is healthy and unhealthy, geometry about the properties of magnitudes, arithmetic about numbers, and the same is true of the other arts and sciences. But rhetoric we look upon as the power of, of observing, the means of persuasion on almost any subject presented to us. And that is why we say 
that in its technical character, it is not concerned with any special definite class of subjects or objects. So it's there's a it's a generalization. It's a it's a um, set of principles uh, that illuminate the fact of persuasion, and these are constructed by him, by Aristotle, around this kind of triangulation of emotion, ethics, and logic. So pathos, ethos, and logos. And if you think about what's going on today, I think you would have to probably make a different graph that is mostly pathos, very little ethos, and um, I don't know to what extent, yeah, pathos and, and logos, but not a shared logos. <clears throat> so what, I, what do I mean by not a shared logos? If I think of algorithmic governmentality and the um, opacity of the algorithms that we navigate when we seek information online, uh, there is definitely logos at play, but it is a logos that is um, opaque to us, whereas the pathos is, is, is our end of the, as consumers at least, as users of social networks and information platforms. And this is our end of the of the bargain. So Aristotle is in a way responsible for opposing the concepts of art and nature, or techne and nature, techne and fusis. He distinguishes on the one hand art or techne from mere experience or basic experience, which uh, imperia as knowledge of the individual form. So your experience in the everyday. Uh, is the experience of individual things around you. But art and techne is the knowledge of the universal or the generalized, or if, if you like to come back to the, the other discussion, a standardized knowledge based on uh, generalizable, generalizable principles. And in metaphysics, he says, um, science comes, um, sorry, what is it? Science epistem from art techne, which is the application of the universal to the individual. Ah, yes, sorry, he distinguishes art or techne from mere experience, which is the experience of the individual or of, of particular individual entities around us, whereas techne is the knowledge of the universal. But he also distinguishes techne from this knowledge of the universal itself, uh, which is science or episteme, because techne is really the application of this knowledge of the universal to the individual. So that's not entirely the same as um, science itself, which is the knowledge of the universal. So he distinguishes the knowledge of the universal from its application to the individual. Um, for example, the doctor is no good if you just have an, um, a general knowledge of, of what the human is, you still have the individual in front of you that you need to engage with and kind of bridge this immense gap between the eternal ideas and the phenomena or the transitory changing and variable phenomena that are um, given to us in experience. So he distinguishes um, techne also from action or praxis because uh, techne is on the side of poiesis or fabrication, which is the disposition to make or fabricate a rhymed to reason. So it's reason together with this disposition to make or fabricate, which isn't exactly the same thing as, um, as pure praxis or action, which doesn't have this kind of poetic or productive element in it. And he distinguishes um, within techne, he distinguishes um, techne, this productive techne from mere convention, for example, conventions uh, in poetry. So on the one hand, you have the uh, techne or art of fabrication, poietike, and on the other hand, you have the art or techne that is based on convention or chromene, I think this is how you pronounce it, uh, which is, for example, um, the techniques in, in music or poetry um, <clears throat> and so forth. And then he distinguishes furthermore the skill of a doctor, for instance, from the skill that is employed in the transformation of a material, a craftsman. So that there's this kind of percolate. On the one hand, you have this concept of technique, which is not the same as science and not the same as the mere experience of individual entities. And within techne, you have these various different articulations of, of different ways of um, producing reliable outcomes. And the most important, I think, uh, 
to, to think about still today is art or techne or technique is an excellence or virtue. It's a very strong word, arete. It's a very um, precious word in the inventory of, of philosophical words. It's a disposition accompanied by a true or right rule. The disposition is rendered as hexis in Greek, habitus in Latin. And so now we're going to come to the, um, sorry, where, is, where do I see the time? Am, am I still in presenter mode here? Not really, no? Right, because in the presenter mode, you could see the time, but I've probably lost this now. Oh, yeah. So what, what can someone tell me what the time is now? Three, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm CET. It's 311. 311? One hour oh. and 15 minutes, I think. Oh part. God, this is too long. So we'll keep, we'll keep nature for the next, for next time. Um, so art is an excellence or virtue, a disposition accompanied by a true or right rule. Disposition is rendered as hexes in Greek and habitus in Latin. And what we're going to see next time, I'm going to run through this perhaps uh, very briefly, but I think we should have like a 10 minute break now, is that uh, this notion of the habit of nature is also something that is um, a kind of fundamental rift in how to think about nature. And one that is still relevant today, if you think that in biology, for instance, we don't consider living beings we do in a way but nobody no biologist can really define what life is uh, we consider i mean or they would define it by mechanisms and mechanisms would be a kind of um, law bound or necessity bound or rule bound behavior and um, uh, sorry so this this um, question of hexes and habitus of how you acquire a habit or a reproducible outcome is is one that is actually quite fundamental in thinking about what nature is too. Um, so let me just see if it makes sense to go through this quickly. So what do we mean when we speak of the nature of things? For example, when we say it is in the nature of capitalism to put profit before people, it seems at first um, that it's a coincidence that we use the word nature for both the inventory of things given in the fauna and flora around us, um, so, so, for example, the the thing that we want to protect from destruction by, I don't know, uh, techno capitalist rationality, as in in Marcuse, for example. And on the other hand, this way of speaking about the nature of things. But we're going to see that actually they are. It's not a coincidence that we use the word nature for both, and they are fundamentally related one to the other. And the fact that they are is the reason why I'm going to bring in um, Simon Don and this wormhole that he makes through the idea of human nature as something that is uh, that has the stamp of the apeiron or the indefinite infinite um on it yeah i think i'm going uh, ahead of me slightly so let's just see quickly i'll stop here and then we'll we'll just wrap this up next time quickly uh, phusis, so nature, the Greek term for nature was phusis, from four, growth or birth. Um, Heidegger had a whole um, thing to say about this, that it's not just growth and birth, but it's it's the fundamental ontological fact that something um, eclore, how do you, okay, off again, how do you translate this? Something, Heidegger had, um, a whole thing about the fact that nature isn't just this kind of uh, growth and birth in the way that Haldolin, for instance, would talk about nature as this super abundant, productive, um, super beast almost. But there's something more fundamental, how things come to be, how things come to be and come to be perceived as well, or step or step into existence. Anyway, it it's, it's, goes a bit too far, I think, now. So fundamentally for fusis or nature, also the term physics comes from fusis, um, from four growth birth, has fundamentally this idea of an autonomous self-organizing power. And, and there's a slightly different connotation in the word nature, 
which links to natality and birth, and which you, the concept that you can find again in the uh, in the concept of nation. For Aristotle in the metaphysics, nature is linked to the idea of genesis and generation. Uh, it has this notion of autonomous internal cause of growth uh, and a law that is imminent to life. Uh, it is also linked to a form of primal matter or hule. And it has, and this is where the nature of things question comes back, it has a substance or usia. This is the idea of nature as essence, namely as the principle of its being and of its movement. This is in opposition to techne, where the object is produced, and the object in this sense is passive because um, it is a natura secundum materiam. It tends to change in a manner that is contingent rather than necessary, so it doesn't follow the laws of nature, um, but it follows our uh, both our input and the fact that they can malfunction or stop functioning altogether. So FUSIS is autonomous versus the technical object which depends on the material that we decide to use and it also depends on an external stimulus, whereas FUSIS has this kind of internal principle of energy. So I think um, it's a bit long, we should probably have a 10 minute break now and then some questions and do we have presentations for this time by the way for this session Anything? no no I, I don't think so uh actually i i need to talk to you about the presentations because uh we have 47 people uh technically doing the seminar and we will need to arrange this how, how we will do the presentations. 47 people. Yeah, wow. but not, not everyone I think is going to show up. But okay. in principle. No, I was just thinking 47 presentations or if, if each time you have two, that's, that's more, more presentations <laughs> than we have um, sessions available for sure. But yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's amazing. And let's think about how, how we do this and let's see how, about how, how many people sign up to do presentations too, because that might not be... Um, the same thing. Not that I want to discourage you at all, because I yeah, yeah, enjoy the presentations always. Okay, in this case, if there isn't a presentation now, I would say we have a 10 minute break. Uh, we come back, uh, we have some questions and answers for a little bit, or we discuss a bit. And then uh, because there's only five slides left, I can finish the slide, or perhaps I can finish the slides and then we can have a discussion. What do you think? Uh, okay. Uh, in, in a way for me, it's fine. Okay, then um, good. What's the time now? Uh, wait, I have to exit here. So I see. Okay, it's it's twenty past here. Shall we meet at half past again? Yeah. Okay. 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 See you in a second then. See you. See you. And there is a similar law here for the answer to that. One, so you know you're you're unmuted. You may want to mute yourself. Sorry. Uh, formal opposition or complicity. Uh,
Crisis y autónomos versus technical objects. You, you've unmuted yourself again.
So uh, perhaps while we're waiting for more folks to return, I have a question, or I mean, I have several questions, but <laughs> um, this is my first time taking a seminar at the new center. What are the presentations? Yeah, don't worry about those. They're, they're very short. So basically, if you read uh, one of the texts that's assigned for the session, you give an account of it. You have 10 minutes. Uh, if there's nobody else giving a presentation, 20. If you give it together with somebody else in 10 minutes, and it's quite flexible. But I would say um, if the whole session is to an hour and a half, then I would say that an hour and a half usually goes with the presentation, discussion, break, and so forth, and one hour is dedicated to the presentation. So half of that for the presentations, depending on how many people present, and half of it uh, roughly or a little bit less, perhaps, because things always inevitably go a bit longer uh, for the discussion. And yeah, so it's it's quite basic. It's literally just reading the text, saying what is the text about, and um, sometimes people actually go into discussion of, of what the text means to them, have their own argument, but mostly it's literally just a matter of, of presenting the text, saying this is what's going on in this text. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and also, we just while we're, you know, we still have a little bit of time, thank you for all of your work. Thank you for offering this, this seminar. I did a master's degree that I completed last year at the new school where I was, I made extensive use and have continued to make extensive use of your translation of on the mode of existence of technical objects. Uh, thank um, you for saying that. Yeah, so I'm I'm so grateful, and I've, I've got your, a copy of your book, an Etymology of Noise, that I I I'll be honest, I've, I've yet to to crack it open, um, but I, I do I do plan to read it, and so I'm just very grateful. I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you say this because translation is such an important work culturally and so um, underrated in terms of. I mean, I, I met one German translator once who was offered to translate the big thesis, the individuation in light of blah blah blah, for for a thousand euros. I thought you did. I mean, you better not even offer anything and just and that was just an insult and and in general, all these really important works that connect cultures, connect people, um, you know, are left to the device of the devices of super overstretched PhD students who are extremely precarious and, and feel so honored to get such an, such an important work and don't realize that they just get it because they're yeah. a little for it. And this is a strange moment historically. I think histor translations now are underrated. If you think, for example, the Arabic translations of Aristotle, and there are various translations into Latin and then arriving at a really good translation of it. It's like, a, I don't know, almost a thousand year work, collaborative work over stretched over the centuries. And it is so monumental and monumentally mm -hmm. important. If we did that more with also less, less translated languages and less translated authors, I think it'd be fundamental, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the work Taylor translating the main thesis so important. I've I've got some. I'm in communication with some folks who work at the Santa Fe Institute and research there, and I've been talking to them about Simontan's work and the importance of it for systems thinking and complexity science and complex just the concept of complexity generally and the centering of relation in that and trying to think through complexity with with Simondo and of course Deleuze, I mean, Deleuze has done that already. It's interesting because person, that, that crowd has been blissfully untouched by Simondo and in, in general by French epistemology. Um, I kind of evolved through that for a while. There used to be, a uh, there is still, but it was much bigger than um, Conference for Systems Theory and Cybernetics in Vienna. I mm. think organized every two years and I, I went there for a few iterations while I was doing my PhD and this is where I met Yagmur Denizan who is um, who gave a talk in the last uh, seminar series on techno and monoculture and she's a really unique person because she's an engineer um, and that's her day job if you like and she's really a philosopher she, she writes about 
biosemiotics and she's a mm. real Simondonian. She's been reading Simondon with a group of um, Turkish researchers for decades really um, <clears throat> without a proper translation to work on and now they have the proper translations and and um, but it's a really awesome when you I mean I've, I've been to so many of these secondary literature events where people become Simondon specialists but they're not scientists or engineers which I'm not also and then to hear someone I don't know articulate these two worlds and with this fascination similar to that which Simondon had Simon, Simondon was not an engineer but he had this love of how things work and yeah really fascinating I'm glad I'm really happy that I hope it's not too difficult to work through this trans translations are always made up of so many decisions you have to it kind was of I'm, it was beautiful, beautiful to read. I was so glad that I made the choice to include it in my, so I did a, uh, I work in the software industry now. That's what I was doing before, took a break for the masters and work there now. And thinking about the relationship, especially the section in the second part on the relationship with computers and programming and what automation is and the, the um the role that humans play in regulating technical ensembles and yeah. thinking about that with some of the work that I'm doing with folks in, working in human factors and ergonomics and working oh, with these beautiful. complex technical systems. I mean he could I mean he you you translate, I don't know what it is in French, but the translation human engineering yes. in there for ergonomics and thinking about that is just was the key to me being able to do to think through this in a coherent did we, way. Did you say human in. engineering because ergonomics would be the correct term, wouldn't it? That I mean, I that's what I assumed was it because I mean that when yeah so yeah yeah go no, back it's, to it's the cybernetics that, yeah. no, it's conferences, the the human factor in in the machine or in the say the cockpit uh, of the of the airplane. I assumed that that just yes, I, I, I presume that I that think was, probably that's what it is. But although I I can't, it's a bit hazy now to think back. There's been also so many people involved on Rogov, obviously, but also the the son of Simondon. I mean, his daughter also reread it, but more for style. And his son is an engineer, and he also kind of updated because I worked with a dictionary of um, because there's no such thing as a translation of French engineering term terms into English it just doesn't exist um, except for one really old-fashioned one and all the most of those terms were a bit outdated so he kind of helped me with with that but yeah there's I think people are back and there's one hand up Anna do you want did you want to say something briefly oh yeah I have a couple of of questions comments related to that I have one thing you said that there wasn't much overlap between Santa Fe Institute and French epistemology wasn't Edgar Moran influenced by French epistemology I, I'm not I haven't read very much of his stuff yet but doesn't isn't he kind of like a point of overlap between the two he is interesting he's um <clears throat> is a famous outsider if, if they're the French are really good at that <laughs> Because I mentioned him in my PhD uh, defense and said the, the famous philosopher Edgar Morin, whom I actually met in the context of one of these systems theory and cybernetics events, because I was translating uh, a book together with a German philosopher, Reinhard, uh, Reinhard Zimmermann. And so I was sitting in front of him. He's just the most extraordinary human being I have ever met in my whole life. He's, <laughs> out, he's out of this world. And um, talking about FUSIS and life energy, I think he was already in his 90s when he gave a talk to 250 people and just Still around, right? a light. He was extraordinary. But when I mentioned him as a philosopher, I was kind of slapped down and said, uh, he's not a philosopher, he's a sociologist. And I, I don't care, to be honest. I think he was, um, I don't, from my knowledge, French epistemology was on, her, on his radar, but not a determining factor in his evolution, not in the same way as it was for Foucault, for example. Um, what he did do as a sociologist who had a really deep philosophical approach to, to this kind of complexity theory, uh, he was really an orchestrator. He was one of the greatest orchestrators of people in philosophy and kind of borderline, kind of borderline philosophers and scientists thinking about complexity theory and putting people together, putting people uh, also on the international map and having these big conferences. So his um, 
he wrote this big tome that um, the one I was translating in part was the nature of nature complexity what kind of what is it called again I can't remember but um it's like a massive roman fleur, roman fleur narrative from uh, the origin of the cosmos to hyper complexities and ethics and it's like a, a kind of loop so he says the same thing again and again in a way that sounds simple but then he kind of adds and folds different dimensions into it and it's true that sometimes for a philosopher it's a bit frustrating to read um yeah. but but what he's doing is really quite profound and i think still needs unpacking do you know the work of uh, Paul Siliers, who is a South African philosopher? No, thanks for mentioning him. Right. So his big book, or I mean, his big book, it's, it's, it's a short book, uh, but his best known book is... Well, you know what Napoleon would say to that? <laughs> you can be short and big at the same time. <laughs> yeah, impactful. Uh, what, what's his name again, Paul? Uh, I posted a, a link to a Wikipedia page into the chat. Um, Paul Sillier's his complexity in postmodernism is his book. His he deals a lot with epistemology at the beginning, and then starts moving a lot into ethics and the ethical implications of Paul this. Yeah. Um, you might find his book interesting. He engages with algorithm, excuse me, algorithmic information theory, um, Kamal-Gorov complexity, and the quantification of information theory, but how. Um, Oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name. There's a um, someone thinking with a philosopher thinking with uh, the quantified conception of information in which they reconceptualize noise as incompressibility, and he gets at that and how this incompressibility is at the heart of complexity. Um, oh, and that's such a good tip. Thank you very much. I'd order one of his books straight away and um if i could join, oh sorry are you still yeah yeah, yeah. And i don't know what is the situation with the seminar so we've got a uh, 45 minutes left um i think it's either we open up the discussion to everyone um i would say or we um or i can also wrap up the last few slides uh, so that next time we have time for the, the kind of more dense lecture approach what, what do you think about that? Is every, everyone back? Because the cameras are off, so you can't really tell. Um, there you go. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, why don't you go ahead with your question? And then I and then I finish the last few slides. So yeah, so... Next week. You know, as might be obvious from talking about Moran and this conversation, I'm working in a really similar area to Nick. I'm really interested in the overlap between Simon Don and complex systems theory. Um, a big reference point for me has been Robert Rosen, who I'm really curious about how to the extent you might have engaged with his work and also like what um <clears throat> philosophers Rosen like, from the kind of computer scientist. Um, well, right, he's doing like mathematical biology, like the biomathics thing, the whole sort of integral biomathics crew and like philosophers like Aaron Gare, who like are doing really exciting stuff, but like kind of in their own little corner. That's like really like, aside from how like memory evolutive systems has kind how of- How do you write Aaron Gare? Um, oh, I'll write it in the chat. Hold on. Yeah, please do. Do uh, just also for everybody else, if you can put the names of the people you mentioned in the chat, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah, it's a weird, weird spelling <laughs> too, though. Um, right, yeah, yeah. Because I know, like, um, you know, he's worked with uh, Andre Arisman, who's also like behind like memory evaluative systems, and like I know was like, you know, in published in like the Glass Bead Journal stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Part of that. Um, so I I'm just really excited to see points of more overlap between the like complex systems people and the biomathics people and like information theory and continental philosophy. I think it's a really exciting moment for that. So probably I have more than one foot in the continental philosophy of French epistemology, and um, I'm a little bit of an intruder because because I forever feel like I'm I'm not a scientist. So there's only so far that I can go, and I'm kind of letting myself be swept with it. But I'm I'm by no means a specialist of computer science or anything like that. Um, yeah. So should, should I go back to the slides? Few slides, and then we. Um, and then we can move on to the 
kind of final discussion a little bit and we have more time next week. Okay. So <clears throat> what we had left here, how do I do this? No. It. Right. How do you go into presentation mode again? Share computer sound. Da, da, da. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Ah, help. I want to go back. Yeah, you can see that from computer science and actually using computers, this is not really happening yet. Yeah, escape. Okay, I'll keep it like this. So we had this idea of um, FUSIS. FUSIS uh, is going to be very important for understanding what Simon Don is on about because for him, one of the fundamental misunderstandings is to think of matter as inert or not as endowed with its own uh, dynamic principles. So for him, FUSIS is already full of potentials and full of virtualities too. So um, it doesn't merely await form. And this is how he, one of the criticisms that he has of Aristotle where matter is basically just waiting for, <clears throat> for form to, um, to, as a principle of individuation. In fact, it's not true. I think, sorry, I rewind for a second. Um, so it's form that brings about the individual, but it is actually matter that is, I think, still for Aristotle, the principle of individuation. And uh, the thing that makes something a hexade, you hear this now, because the forms obviously are eternal and um, and universal. So they're not individual in that sense. So forces for growth, birth, uh, autonomous, self-organizing power, um, a slightly different connotation to this idea of natura from uh, birth and natality. Um, more englobing, I think it's a greater, it's a bigger notion than birth because it's not only about the bringing about of individuals or ontogenesis. Um, I think there is in FUSIS a whole kind of process philosophy implied already of the different elements and the transition between the elements and, and so forth. So Aristotle in his metaphysics, he associates the concept of uh, FUSIS, so, so nature with uh, genesis and generation with the concept of uh, internal cause of growth or uh, with having a law that is imminent to life, that is specific to it and uh, imminent to the living entity, as opposed to the technical object that has uh, its law of functioning imposed from the outside and whose um, cause of growth or energy input is also external. Uh, FUSIS is also the primal matter or the elements. Uh, and uh, and FUSIS or nature refers also to the concept of substance. And substance, this is where this um, kind of slippage, when we talk, for example, about the nature of capitalism, which sounds like an oxymoron because we're in the business of trying to rescue uh, nature from a kind of profit-driven ideology that, that seems to be complicit in destroying nature. <clears throat> and yet this idea of substance or usia or nature as the essence or principle of animation is something that actually connects the two and, and that slightly blurs also the boundary between uh, what is what we now consider to be either natural or artificial. And yet for Aristotle still, there is a kind of distinction to techne and even Simon Don also makes a distinction between the natural and the technical object. And we'll get back to that in, in the next session. Because the object in the technical object is produced as something passive. It is a natura secundum materiam for the medievals. It tends to change in a manner that is contingent rather than necessary. Contingent doesn't mean here necessarily that changes randomly but it cha its change is contingent upon my uh, ingenuity. So I impose what happens to, to the technical object, what happens to inert matter. I put things together in such a way that uh, it has a certain uh, lifespan and um, dynamism or, or to it. 
but it depends on something else than itself. In that sense, it, it's contingent. And it has a contingency, I would say, also because it has uh, tendencies to mal malfunction or to simply, um, without further energy input, to simply stop functioning altogether. So FUSIS is autonomous versus the technical object which depends on the material used and on an external um, stimulus. So this is a really bare bones approach to how this kind of bifurcation of these two becomes increasingly significant. So here we have also this, just to home in more on this idea of nature as synonymous with essence, which is going to be important when we try to think about uh, Simon Don talking about the nature of the technical object, the essence of technicity. That, so the na what is the nature of technicity um, or human nature? And especially when he says that human nature is um, tributary to this apeiron or a, a fundamental lack of determinacy. So in that sense, your human nature, as opposed to the common idea that nature is kind of mechanical, the Cartesian idea that nature is a kind of mechanical law bound machine fundamentally. Here you have the idea that there is something in nature that is totally indeterminate, as yet indeterminate. And then that that is not only um, a margin of play in the sense that things can turn out differently. Uh, it is fundamental, it's essential to human nature that there is this apeiron or this indeterminacy. And, and that's what I tried also to bring out with the Merleau-Ponty quote maybe worth perhaps just going back to this one. The nature of consciousness, which consists in having no nature. It's a play of words, obviously, but that in essence, it has a form of indeterminacy without which it wouldn't be consciousness, but mere reflection, like a mirror, for example. Okay, so nature is synonymous with essence. Nature is not only the originary substrate or materia prima, but it is essentially this organizing form or organizing principle. So the substance is what makes something different. What is its uh, imminent organizing principle? And just there in the back of your mind, it doesn't really make sense at this point um, that, that in this sense of originary substrate, which Simondon will connect with the notion of the apeiron, there is no pre-given organizing principle. And this is where the notion of invention is going to come in, in its collective dimension as well. But I don't want to confuse you too much. So here in kind of ancient Greek philosophy, this is, this is the idea, nature as substantial, essential organizing principle or form or eternal idea. For example, in the nature of a triangle, there's, there's rules, specific rules, how the triangle or a particular triangle is, um, not a particular, but how a specific type of triangle is constructed. Nature is also the formal difference. So again, the form, the specific um, form uh, from another substance, for example, the difference between silver and gold. It is the divine archetype. So here we're moving very far away from Fusis as the kind of, um, what do you call it, a kind of engine of poiesis of uh, the, um, the things that exist in nature and you, you move beyond what exists into the realm of the divine archetypes. It's the model of a creature, I mean, in this, in this paradigm, in God's mind, or a kind of divine intelligence or the, the fact of intelligibility of the world. And what I always find fascinating when you go back to the history of philosophy is that ideas that sound um, very far removed from us, like the, the the archetype in God's mind, and I'm by no means a creationist, and I don't want to be anywhere near creationist, I guess. Uh, and yet, the fundamental belief that the universe is intelligible, a form of faith, is is something that isn't totally divorced from that mindset. It's different in the way that we put it. It has a different context. Um, it has a plumage of rationality. And yet even this rationality fundamentally is based on the faith of the intelligibility of the universe. So the principle of movement or it's the animation. And it's important to remember that anima or the word, the Latin word for soul is simply fundamentally means what is animated, what what has movement or intrinsic movement. 
so in the Dictionnaire du Moyen Âge, I've got some really beautiful dictionaries here, and that one was a, a big surprise to me because um, when I bought it, I thought it was about philosophy, but it's like full of saints and weird stuff that happened in the Middle Ages, but it's written by a really awesome philosopher or put together. Um, uh, Alain de Libera, uh, Claude Gauvard, Michel Zink, and Alain de Libera is an interesting one, maybe to if anyone like you has a curiosity like me uh, for this, because he thinks about medieval philosophy in a way that is actually extremely contemporary. Not always easy to read, and um, I think he's quite well translated as well. So nature, in this sense, if you think of the uh, the divine archetype that is part of uh, Fusis, or of this kind of productive energy plus the divine archetype. Nature is a term that then subsumes what is and what has no being or what has no existence in this world. So it's bigger than just the fauna and flora, for example, or bigger even than our solar system or the known universe in the empirical sense. Nature, um, I don't know if some of you also were part of the Whitehead seminar, the Great Refusal. Uh, it's really interesting that he had a fantastic account of how nature is just one time well it's the it's the three dimensions or uh, four with time that are a region of the real so here we have this idea of nature as something much bigger than what exists in empirical experience namely the realm of the archetypes uh, which would be the realm of mathematics i suppose for whitehead certainly but probably also for uh, plato so it exceeds nature exceeds what is, but not in, in a way that uh, there is nature that is um, negative in a way that you subtract being from it, but in a, sen in, sen in a sense of plenitude. So rather than being less than what exists, it is a more inclusive totality, a universitas. It should be nice if the universities were like this now, that includes what creates and is not created. In other words, what is eternal or the creative principle? Nature includes what creates and not only what exists in empirical experience and what hence is created. It includes also what is created and creates. So for example, the birth, an animal giving birth. And it includes what is created and does not create. And I suppose you could... Uh, put this loosely in the category of um, inanimate matter, although I, I think with Simon Don we, we would not think about matter as something inanimate. So nature as uh, then the biggest concept or the, the most ambitious concept of nature is that uh, which is synonymous with God. And um, I remember now keenly that Ray Brassier once said we should have a moratorium on philosophers talking about God and I agree but then you can't talk about medieval philosophy anymore so I'm, I'm just trying to be explicit here making making it clear I'm not reintroducing uh, specifically theology into contemporary philosophy I'm not really interested in the concept of God I am interested however how apparently um, sober scientific accounts of nature are actually often still indebted to theology without realizing it. And that's how, how I think it's still important sometimes to talk about theological concepts. So nature is synonymous in God with God in what sense? In the sense that, and this is a discovery I made here, I always thought that this ex famous expression, natura naturans and natura naturata, that it came from uh, Spinoza. But actually it came from Averroes. Uh, Averroes was a... Um, Cordoban, uh, he was from Cordoba, I think, from uh, the kind of Arab-speaking uh, Spanish enclave. Um, I, I can't remember what his origin was. I think Avicenna was Persian, but otherwise, I don't know. So he came up with, in his translation of Aristotle, of this distinction between nature as a creative principle, nature natura naturans, and natura naturata as what this creative principle produces. Can you close the door, please? Just have a quick look here. Uh, sorry, just one second.
Sorry about that. I know I'm looking in the wrong dictionary, so that's, that's why I couldn't find the natura naturans because, um, so I think that's quite an interesting uh, distinction between the kind of creative principle and, and that which is created by it, which you can then, um, with Simon Don, think about in terms of individuation and the result of it, which is the individual. And what is the difference between the individuation and the individual? That brings us back to the initial quote, this is the aperon. The individual, the finished individual, the natura naturata is, if you like, for Simon Don, um, the, the individual has, the, it, it's the process that has exhausted its aperon or, or the kind of indeterminacy that still gave it a leeway for further development and change. So this concept of nature then uh, is always, as such has always existed as, a, as an opposite. So a nature in, is fundamentally, if you think about it, and I think this is very important, a relata is something that you can't think, you can't think can't nature without thinking techne, artifice, or nomos, uh, the law. And in the Middle Ages, interestingly enough, the opposite of nature <clears throat> was not history of, or culture as, as today, but the concept of grace, the supernatural. And bef again, before this sounds too uh, weird, and I'm, you know, I'm not gonna get into talking about miracles or anything like that. I also bumped into a really interesting reference uh, that illuminated what I really struggled to understand with Nietzsche: the idea of the Superman, or what the what is greater than man in the man in man, and the supernatural. Then, in this sense, as initially discussed, as as what is not merely given in the empirical world, but includes the creative principle that brings the empirical world about as in, in, its, in the form that we know it. And also, um, and also for instance, the realm of, of um, archetypes that, are, um, that lend themselves to intelligibility by, through which nature lends itself to uh, reason. So quickly, this idea of grace. Um, if any of you have read Quentin Meillassou, for instance, um, it's not an interesting. Even, even Badiou has a few uh, encounters with the concept of grace. I think it's in some footnotes to being an event. If I don't remember, I think it's in the second tome. It's not something to be discarded offhand because fundamentally it goes back to the question whether um, one that has actually a bigger history, I think, in um, Islamic philosophy than in, in Christian theological thought and in Christian philosophy. The question whether, if you don't want to say God, whether nature or the creative principle that generates also its own um, immanent principles and laws whether it is free to change the, to generate new laws and principles, or whether once these laws are produced, it is stuck with them forever. So the question fundamentally is how free is God? Is God free only once? And once he's created the universe, he's stuck with it and he, he can't, he's no longer free to change the rules or is it possible to change? So that on the one hand is, is the question of, of how, fundamental concept of contingency in this sense of, of um, the truly unpredictable you want to think of. And I think there are contemporary accounts of um, epistemology and philosophy of science that look at the laws of nature or the laws of physics as in relative terms as conventions too, and as falsifiable to a certain extent at least, or as applicable within a certain um, paradigm but maybe not uh, beyond that and and beyond that would then be uh, i think a contemporary question of a similar importance to the question of grace uh, for the medievals who clearly were grappling with this in, in a completely different language to our own unless obviously you're um, religious so grace the reluctance of some medievals to recognize the full autonomy 
to recognize full autonomy to the organization of nature. So to say that what exists, the natura naturata, has its own self-organizing principle, and to say no, actually that there, there is grace, uh, the event, there is there is the possibility that um, that this could suddenly or radically change. Uh, it's also a more opposed to the to a relatively modern notion of pure nature, or I think what he means here is the idea of um, mere nature or nothing but nature. So nature without God or nature without a transcendent principle. So just nature as physics um, and with, within physics as a kind of complex uh, dimension of it, biology, for instance, chemistry, obviously, and, and biology is a kind of a higher level of, of complexity. So this idea of grace would then be uh, opposed to that. Um, the idea that nature is not like a clockwork that once created stays the same forever and ever. And so you could think about that one in terms of uh, Darwinian evolution and the role of chance as something that actually breaks open this clockwork image of nature that was still very prevalent for Descartes um, and also for Spinoza, also for Leibniz, I think, or Leibniz maybe in brackets, I don't know him so well. Um, and certainly for Alfred North Whitehead, whom we discussed in, in the other uh, seminar, I think uh, it would be ludicrous and silly to think about nature as this clockwork, as something that once created would always stay the same. So I think this is the last slide. <laughs> it's a bit unfortunate to end on, on miracles when all I'm trying to do is extricate myself from this language. But I think it was, it, it kind of surprised me when I read it. Miracles then were thought of, at least by the more philo philosophically inclined medievals, not as supernatural and not as against nature or kind of contravening the laws of nature. And, and one of the reasons why I'm kind of sympathetic to this set of questions is that when people talk about negentropy in secondary literature and in, in the humanities, and I think scientists would probably never express themselves like this, um, I think it was even Raymond Rouillard who, the expression does kind of circulate in philosophy that things happen against um, the law of, um, what is it called again? The law, of, not the law of entropy. I forgot now. I'm sorry. I'm kind of running out of steam. My fusis is a bit exhausted. <laughs> um, as if self-organization and negentropy was something that could happen against the natural tendency of physical processes to kind of peter out in entropy. And clearly nothing happens against the laws of nature, even if the laws of nature that we can formulate and formalize are still approximations because we know a fraction of what we would need to know to encompass uh, fully the laws of nature. So miracles were thought of not as supernatural and not as against nature. They certainly were by some, but not by the philosophically inclined medievals, but simply as following other rules than the ones we are used to. So this is a really important point about empiricism that you could also apply to discussions about statistics. If statistics, and even you could also apply this to the question of data. If data is a form of um, evaluation of frequency of what happened in the past, you end up with um, regularities that are um, based on convention and habit. It's what we're in the habit of encountering. But they can't predict what we haven't encountered yet. So I think this question, this is this is still a kind of interesting, an interesting reticence to positivism, I would say, or or a kind of basic empiricism is to say that what we experience, uh, the rules that we experience, are simply the ones that we are used to. For example, uh, I mean, one of the examples that was used in this article is water normally um, in habitually in our kind of everyday experience, water is what flows downwards, but uh, in the tides it can flow upwards. How can this happen? This is clearly not something that goes against nature, but if you've never seen the tides, you might be surprised by it, or if uh, there's other phenomena like this that um, 
if it's outside of the realm of your experience, you might be surprised by it, but it doesn't mean that it's um, against nature or supernatural or outside of nature. So there's an interesting concept that pops up here that will be important for Simon Don, although we're not going to discuss it in this seminar, but it's it's perhaps worth jotting down for yourselves, is this idea of seminal causes. And the author of this um, dictionary of the uh, Middle Ages, I mean, it's not of the whole dictionary, but of this entry, um, Jean-Luc Soler, he uses a really striking expression, which is a delayed detonation, a concept with delayed detonation. The seminal cause is something that is kind of implanted and that whose causality will pop up or be actually activated or um, rendered efficacious by a circumstances that have not yet occurred. So this, I think, is a concept to come back to in terms of thinking about virtuality. If you think about matter as something that is not simple and passive and homogeneous, but something that contains potentialities and virtualities, uh, these seminal causes um, is, a, is a very strange, interesting concept. Interestingly, also for us, is an idea that was introduced or, or certainly articulated very well by um, Thomas of Aquinas, the hierarchy of causes. So that a miracle, what appears to be a miracle or what appears to be supranatural uh, can also be to a certain extent, something that is imbricated in a hierarchy of causes. So each cause constitutes a particular system, but each system is included in a superior system whose causes are more general. And there is a universal system for them, obviously this, this kind of uh, totality of, of nature that contains everything depending on the first cause, which would in, in for Aquinas certainly be God. Um, so hence, what is contrary to nature according to a particular system is not necessarily so according to a superior system. What was the example here? Oh, sorry, I just need to open the door. One sec. So at the risk of confusing you, I'll just tell you the reason why I um, ended on this is that as I was reading this, uh, it uh, reminded me of uh, an author that, that was very important for me, which is Henri Atlon, who developed a concept of uh, complexity on the basis of noise, which is not the same as order on the basis of noise. So the idea of order on the basis of noise is, for example, you have a, a random heap of... Um, uh, items, you shake them up, and it turns out they're magnets, and they kind of all order themselves into something that looks orderly. I mean, this is a concept of order which with, with which I can have no, it means nothing to me. I can't see why something that would look regular would have more order to it than something that looks like a random heap. Um, apart, apart from that, so this is not about the idea of order from noise, but the idea of complexity on the basis of noise. And Atlan develops a similar um, kind of hierarchical organization of a system in which he says that if you have a complex system and within each subsystem, you have potentially noise, so the interruption of communication be between a point A and B, that individual system might either malfunction or if the noise is too much, it might break down completely. But that doesn't mean that the overall system breaks down. And if you consider the overall system like a complex organism, for example, having to adapt to a changing environment, in the uh, there's a concept by, uh, I think it was by Ross Ashby of requisite variety. So if a system has, I don't know, a set number of possible responses to an environment and the environment changes, Obviously, the system um, fails to adapt. However, if this noise introduces a variety of a kind of initially what appears to be malfunctioning, but a, a kind of variety of outcomes that are 
um, detrimental at the individual level of each subsystem, but overall create a greater variety that may um, offer greater adaptability to changing circumstances. In that case, you could you could have um, this effect of a kind of um, what he said here, a universal system that contains everything depending on the first cause. So you could have a reordering of your causality according to a higher principle. For example, I think here one of the examples was uh, obviously the tides, which uh, rather than water flowing according to gravity on Earth uh, flows um, in a slightly different way according in, 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 in the interaction with the gravity of um, the attraction towards the moon. Uh, what was the other example? Um, but the other example wasn't so good. And I lost it. The moon not being luminous, not because it's luminous by itself, but because it reflects the light of the sun. It's not good. It's, these are not good examples for the connection I'm making with Atlan. It just struck me that the idea, <clears throat> much less rigid and mechanical than Descartes and the kind of foundations of modern science, ultimately, modern science that a scientist and mathematician like Whitehead would fiercely critique, that you still have here this idea of um, a margin of play, that things don't have to necessarily follow always the same rules and that imbricated in a greater or more complex system, things can still work out. I don't know if that makes sense. So this is opposed to the not only to the modern ideas, but opposed even to Spinoza and also to Kant or even a kind of more positivistic, uh, dogmatic interpretation of natural laws. And uh, the author here gave the example of Kant's uh, polygomena, where he says nature and the existence of things insofar as determined by the universal laws. So here you have a kind of, you have the universal laws, but with margins of play between its subsystems. So there, there is the possibility of something um, happening that would appear like a miracle or that would uh, you could say in the category of uh, Badiou as an event as something that disrupts the normal course of events the norm the, that disrupts the known situation um but that is not so to speak supernatural or um against nature but that fundamentally just topples the conventions of thought and and um the habits of the kind of frequentist thinking that I think also our reliance on big data um, probably reanimates a little bit. I think you you notice probably I'm kind of running out of steam a bit and it's a bit long. So I think we should have a discussion now I need to close this. Okay, stop share. Are you still with me? Nick, uh, you just posted. I, I'll just go to the last um, message I see here. But please go ahead if you if you there's still time to chat and discuss a little. So, sorry, I, I think I rambled a bit towards the end. I'm a little bit exhausted so suddenly. A system should not only have the requisite variety it needs to cope with its environment. It should have more variety. Excess diversity in a system allows the system to cope with novel features in the environment without losing its identity. As long as one remembers that identity is now a dynamic concept which is subject to change. Oh, this is beautiful. This is exactly this is exactly this very close to this idea of I think noise complexity on the basis of noise. What is more, if a system has more diversity than it needs in order to merely cope with its environment, it can experiment internally with alternative possibilities. Amazing. So if you connect this back to the Malo Ponti's quote, that we have a gift that is no gift or a nature that is no nature, is is um, it's a kind of fundamental clause of noise, if you like, in our own functioning, in, in human nature itself, a fundamental indeterminacy that clearly causes a lot of problems for our everyday functioning, I think. It can be, I'm still hopeful that it's going to, be beneficial eventually i'm still with okay go ahead anna so um yeah nick in response to that awesome quote that you posted first of all how do you pronounce that guy's name again 
I believe it's Paul Sillier's is how, how you Sillier's. It. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, I agree with Cecile. That's like a really amazing quote. It actually makes me think a lot of like, a lot about like the stress on redundancy when you're talking about distributed systems and even like people like um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and like the concept of antifragility where it's like, you know, how redundancy or like sort of an access amount of diversity is really important for, for that, for something to actually not only be able to be robust, like I feel like in this sense, robustness would be close to requisite variety because it is able to maintain itself, but an antifragile system would be closer to, um, you know, kind of um, that excess variety that would actually be able to grow from disorder. The one question I would have though about this, and this is also I think is sort of the limit of Taleb's antifragility, and also why I think it might be a little bit crypto capitalist, at least to me, is um, the extent to which it's still looking at the perspective of a single system. So if you're looking at how a single system is capable of growing from its environment, you're also looking at how it's potentially capable of overcoming and like consuming other systems. Um, and so I, I noticed that, um, I forget, I think it was like the blockchain socialist guy who was, I just thought this was like a tweet or something, but he posted this thing of like, you know, antifragility is out, stigmergy is in or something like that. And so I, like stigmergy, like thinking about like how ants like <laughs> coordinate with each other or whatever. Um, and I, I thought that was a really interesting thing that kind of got me thinking. I don't know if there's any really good literature on that, but I guess sort of the next step here, as I kind of see it is the question of, not just access variety within one system, but would it be possible to have access variety in the way that different systems relate to each other? <laughs> like maybe sympoesis kind of type. It's, inter it's interesting when you say that because when you said a single a single system, in the in this kind of medieval framework, the single system would be the totality of nature, which includes also what is not extant in the empirical world. <clears throat> so you would have a kind of plurality of, of systems of natura naturata, of, of things that exist, but you have a kind of overall um, a dimension of possibilities, I think, that, that would be this total system. The, the question is, is it possible to think of a, plur a plurality of these englobing systems? I mean, we certainly have a relative pl plurality in the empirical world or you know on a sociological level on a political level on a cultural level on a biological level we have niches and and apart from anything we have of, of course so many actual individuals in terms of organisms but you could think every atom is a system in itself too but so the question is how you how you even define a system what is the individuality of the system that you're referring to and, and its robustness with respect to another system within which it has to operate? There's this amazing paper by Wolpert and, oh my God, I always forget his name, Kolchinsky, I think, about um, syntactic versus semantic information. I can actually post it in the chat where they try, oh, to, please define, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. try to define a system in terms of of their formal definition of semantic information, which is basically like negentropy. It's related to negentropy. It's really exciting. Um, the physicist Carlo Rovelli has also done exciting stuff with it. They've kind of been collaborating and like oh, Rovelli I is like a, a favorite. Yeah, do po post it, post it. Yeah, yeah, okay, let me let me pull it up. I was also thinking we, because if we can go like five, 10 minutes over, we could do like a quick round of introductions so that everybody gets a quick chance to, um, some of you have met before and I'm happy to see again. Um, but some of you I don't know yet. So it'd be amazing for me to hear. Uh, maybe I mean I can see your names on the screen, but you can just say perhaps what brought you to the seminar, what you're doing at the moment, what your interests are. Um, do you know if is that okay for you if we do that quickly? And I'll I'll just kind of um well, Nick, you've kind of presented yourself a little bit already. Uh perhaps it'd be good to hear from some of the people that haven't had a chance to to speak yet. Um uh, so I'll just go around, um, also including the people I've met before, because you might not have met each other, um, in the order of the, the way that you appear on my screen. So, Ioannis, um, do you want to say a couple of words? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a student in the Art and Curatorial Practice Program. Uh, this is my third now, I would say, like, um, credit seminar. Um, I was in Cecil's um, technically beyond monoculture, and this is actually my attempt uh, to continue exploring Simondon's thought, which 
I find it extremely complex still, but um, challenging in a very good sense. Um, and I'm a writer, an art historian, uh, and a translator. I don't know if I said that, so nice to... What to... languages do you translate? Or into uh, mostly in English, Greek, and I've started with German, like lately. Uh, so apologies for my appalling pronunciation <laughs> and spelling of any of the Greek words. I so regret <laughs> that I didn't learn Greek at school. It's It's terrible. I never knew it was going to be so important to me. But uh, but I had to say that because you included uh, you know so many word origins today and the words in Greek that um, most of those really um, really make sense if you connect them with um, with the use of these words today like in modern Greek I don't know I'm just noting it they don't uh, or they do they do so um, it's a bit like if you challenge those. Um, those words and the origins they had um, as they were used in ancient Greece. Um, there's this great potential, I, I mean, in uh, um, figuring um, how the meanings of these words have changed throughout the years and what this could mean for Simondon, like using them so many centuries later on. I don't know, just a note. Yeah, thank you. Um, Georgiana? Hello, uh, I'm Georgiana. I'm a second year student uh, with a transdisciplinary studies cohort. Um, I am also a researcher with the University of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam. And I'm uh, I'm programming, um, I'm working on this uh, uh, program called Morphic Minds. And we're going to look into how poets um, responded to, I don't know, physical theories of uh, like physics of their time. For example, um, right now I'm a lot into Tennyson and um, I'm reading this book into thermopoetics. And then um. I, <laughs> yes, and it's, um, it's a very interesting path that I just started. I'm a bit intimidated and excited. And um, because ba basically Morphic Minds wants to be a transdisciplinarian project between poetics and technology. And I think Simon Don, alongside others like Michel Serre are like amazing uh, thinkers. Um, and yeah. I am really looking forward for the seminar. And I was looking forward since the summer. <laughs> oh, that's so yeah. nice to hear. Thank you. Uh, this is a really beautiful crossover because if, if anything, if you realize how Plato's poems have still influenced how we think about the laws of nature, for instance, that's quite a quite a big deal, I think. I uh I think <clears throat> like I'm so glad. Um, you touched upon like medieval views and miracles and physics because I am reading this uh, book The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish and I've been thinking like actually poets played a lot with the, the issue of the miraculous or like changing if you think of, of, of Rimbaud for example like he just took um, yeah nature if I can call it that but then you realize you can play with it um you can uh let's say make it have other rules <laughs> yeah thank you very much um Juan hello everyone everyone um I am Juan uh, Toro um I don't know so, um yes um i am en enrolled in in the seminar i am an artist painter uh, and um i am interested interested in the problematic of the human the living on the technique from the perspective of, of already constituted individuals um yes uh, i think this uh, i have this idea about uh, the the good is not absolute, absolutely uh, reducible, reducible to the nature, natural, but 
at the same time um, as a philosophical, um, properly speaking, I'm not sure, sure that the pre-Socratic movement is the opening of um, knowledge with the apeiron. Um, but there are, um, we would have uh, to think about knowledge beyond what is uh, obligatory in language, for example. I don't know. Um, um, yes, I don't know what that says. Uh, uh, in this moment, uh, I think in, uh, I am currently working of the notion of group in in a inter in a, a, in an interdisciplinary group um, called, called uh, the Wombers Collective. It's, um, it's a platform for for interdisciplinary artist research in media ecology. This is all. No, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we probably, I don't know how, uh, and, and Enrique, how much time we have left, but probably we need to pay slightly, <clears throat> slightly quicker through the other introductions. We can we can come back to each introduction a little bit more next time. But um, Luca, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, is there, I think Alan just, uh, um, I have, he has to go. Okay. Um, Amy, do you want to say quickly? The, or the ones who want, who need to go, do you want to introduce yourselves quickly or? She gone already. I think she's gone. So any of uh, you can you're very welcome to you know put your hand up or, or just introduce yourself quickly if you're in a hurry to leave. Um otherwise Luca, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, hi everyone and hi Cecile. Uh, so I am a performance artist. I'm already a part of the new center for research and practice. And um I for the past two years my art and thoughts have been preoccupied with this notion of contingency or at least art is a possible place of uh, contingent experiences and I have been reading up Hala Finitude and um, uh, Brassier and all of the speculative realist team and then also epistemology of noise and this is how I got into um, the new center as well so this seminar is just my continu continuation of uh, thinking Simon Dom because I have been um, part of the previous seminar that ended like a couple of maybe just two weeks ago or something like that. And um, I share this interest in uh, Simon Dom because I see that he's very prominent right now and that he can be thought of from many like fields of human interest, not just uh, one or two, like from design to media and so on. So yeah, thank you everyone. Oh, thank you. I, also, I see we can go until 45, but I, st I still think we probably need to um, be quick because time flows so, so quickly. Uh, Diego. Hi, my name is Diego Moreno. Um, uh, I'm enrolled in the Critical Philosophy Program. I came from Colombia. And I'm making my PhD on Friedrich Schlegel philosophy of history. And this, the seminar is interesting for my work because I am always working with this couple of concepts, uh, nature and culture, um, how are intricated in the development of history. And uh, I'm also, I, I read Simon Dunn. Uh, for my MA dissertation about um, of the, philosophy, the philosophy of behavior in the work of Jacob von Uxkul and Merlo Ponti and Husserl. So thank you. I'm very excited. Uh, amazing. I hope, hope not to disappoint. <laughs> um, Ishita. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi, Cecile. Hi, everyone. Um, I am um, I'm, I'm a first year student with the transdisciplinary studies program, and uh, this is my third credit seminar. Um, I, I I read Simondon uh, very very briefly for my master's dissertation as I was studying the work of an outsider artist, um, Russian outsider artist uh, currently based in Glasgow, and I was working with his ideas of. Um, techniques and individuation. Um, 
but um i have, I have to say that i found the readings assigned challenging uh, which is a, a, which is the good thing also because uh, my current work um deals in working with the idea of nature in the lower himalayas and um a lot of mythic ecologies have emerged with my work with the community and um in in that sense um our conversations today have been quite interesting because i have found more clues in the closer i go to the particulars rather than the universal and uh, i'm i'm still trying to sort of wrap my head around that i'm i'm also interested in how if at all these ideas of uh, the techne if they can overlap with what i'm currently studying in with the gandhian ideas of uh, techniques which were much more uh, personal and immanentist in that sense so yeah that's me that well, sounds fascinating fascinating set of of uh, connections in which to branch out uh, all of your yeah. introductions here uh, jerina is that the right way to pronounce your name that works as well <laughs> No, please tell me how how to say it properly. I Yerina and Jerina are both okay. Thanks. Okay, Yerina. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is my second class at the new Center for Research and Practice. I'm doing a certificate in post-planetary universal design. I noticed that from my first class, I already abandoned quite a few of ideas that I had thought I wanted to pursue when I started here. So now I'm just sort of exploring and. Um, I do some freelance movie distribution on the site and um, other things that are not very related. And on technology and tech, I finally read Heidegger, the question concerning technology. Uh, so I was interested to explore other perspectives. So, yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Tyler? Yeah, hello, I'm Tyler. Um... From the United States. Let's see. Yeah, I was. Uh, I've graduated from my undergraduate school a couple of years back, and I've always. I majored in the philosophy and history, but it was mostly analytic philosophy. So these more sort of theoretical, or uh, you know, sort of the. I don't know what you call them, avant-garde approaches to 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 philosophy or this transdisciplinary, uh, you know, kind of nature. It really uh, interests me, but I've always felt like kind of an outsider to it. So. I discovered the the new center just a while back, and I've kind of just jumped, uh, you know, head first into all this. So it's uh, it's exciting. It's, a little, it's very challenging, I'll say. So I'm excited to learn uh, learn a lot. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Amazing. Cool, Rodolfo. Hi, Cecil. Sorry for being in bed, but I'm a little bit ill. Um, well. Um, I am Rodolfo from Mexico and I'm, I'm a visual artist also. And mostly I work or what is of my concern is materials in painting and materials, you know, doing things and thinking on, I, th I think somehow I, uh, I am, Yes, mo mostly that and how ma the uh, uh, the organization or constant reorganization of materials produce new images in already uh, given objects, something like that. So that's uh, of my concern. And I've been reading or trying to read Simon Don, so I, I hope this is go going to be an, um, uh, a new opportunity for you doing so. Um, thank you, Rodolfo. Nice to see you again. Um, Rafael. Hello, um, I'm Rafael. I'm from the French part of Switzerland. I am a music composer officially, and uh, now I study uh, lyrical singing in Basel. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've, I was interested in Simon Don before, before doing the past also seminar. So I'm in the first year of the art and curatorial practice. And um, yes, I, I don't know, like and for now, I, I'm, I'm a bit in the process maybe of what Tanguilem was doing also of studying something with n n the uncertainty to really do it as a professional some, sometimes or not, but as a kind of, a, uh, I don't know, kind of a strange 
faith in that that it will help to have a real technical understanding of you know being the music performer at, or something and so yeah it's um it's always surprising i i always have very much interest in in reading some texts of simon Bon i don't know and in some way in some way it's like a free psychotherapy that i ha don't have to to go through i don't know why it has a kind of calming also effect on you know all the doubts and blah 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 so yeah yeah, I have to admit that um, once you get through the difficulty, which is actually just a question of patience with, with Simon Don, because he goes into the details of so many different things and it's impossible to know all these domains. And, and so the hit of being confronted with something new all the time, once you kind of when you, once you're just patient and you take it one step at a time, there's something very reassuring about this. Um line of individuation the problem of individuation going through all of these um in fact isabel stengers finds it too reassuring and i, I don't disagree with her entirely in fact i, I think i kind of dis i agree with her a little bit too but um yeah to be discussed gregory it's nice to see you again as well do we have time for me to introduce myself really quickly yeah 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 if we if we i'm sure i mean we've got like I put it in the chat. Five, five I, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, it's in the chat. I'm, I'm Gregory. I've been here for now almost a year. I'm so grateful for this. There's almost no way to get this sort of material, a, a serious read of this sort of material where I live. None of the universities do it, but they're all analytics. So somebody else mentioned that. Anyway, so I'm happy to be here and looking forward to reading Simon Don. I've had this book now for a year and I have tried to read it and I'm only now getting into it. So it's... It's I don't know if it would help you. Uh, I found that if I really cannot read a book, um, I read it backwards. So okay. Like you start like with the last line and then you do the last paragraph and then you do the last section in the last chapter. Eventually you kind of go like, okay, now, now I can I can do what this. What I loved about Otherwise this session, I I'm not going to take a whole bunch of time and I'm sorry for interrupting. What I loved about this session was I started reading it. I, I While I was reading it, when you talk about nature, when Simon Don talks about nature, I started thinking, oh, well... Um, not just Heidegger, but also Nietzsche talked about nature as phusis. And so I, I started making these sort of pre-Socratic connections, thanks to our reading and thanks to this seminar. And, and it turned out I was right. So it, it really helped to get, you know, when you read something and you make a connection, you always have this sort of insecurity in your head that maybe I'm, maybe I'm making a leap here that's wrong, but I was really glad to hear that. So your, your PowerPoint helped me immensely to know that I'm on the right track. So I'm grateful. Thank you very much. I, I hope, yeah, I thought it, it might be good because Simon Don is so dense and the paper I wrote is a bit dense too. I thought it might be worth having a kind of soft level of redundancy of the basic coordinates of the concepts, conceptual space that we're going to move in so that then it doesn't feel too crazy afterwards. Um, Nick, you've kind of <laughs> reappeared in, in a different spot, but... Uh, Oh no, I everybody's kind of moved around on my screen now because people are leaving. Um uh, I'm confused. Well, what um sorry, is it uh March? Do you, you have your hand up? You might have to leave probably soon. Hey. Yes. So do we have time to share an experience? Yeah, I would say oh, it's 47. If we just maybe say a couple of words each quite quickly, and then the next week we we if you guys put your hands up who haven't had a chance to say mm -hmm. you okay know. so my name is Mert and I'm an artist from Turkey and I'm like um taking this seminar because I really like objects that's it <laughs> okay <laughs> great um Nick do you wanna for, for those of you who weren't here during the break do you want to say quickly Sure. Doing? My name is Nick Travellini. Uh, you see him pronouns. I live in Oakland, California. Uh, I'm taking this seminar because I am fascinated by Gilbert Simondon and folks who have come subsequently who've worked with his work, like Gilles Deleuze, like yourself, uh, Cecile, and, and many others. Um, and I am trying to think about how to incorporate Simon Don's thinking, which sort of precedes the concept of complexity as a as a definite concept, um, incorporate that into 
that the concept of complexity and practical work that I'm doing you know, around concepts of safety and how to produce safety and, and resilience of complex socio-technical oh, systems. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's that where thinking about this is, is sort of coming into play, is the theoretical background for that. Okay, I look forward to hearing more about that and exchanging more. Um, Denise? Um, hi, Cecile. Hi, everyone. Nice seeing you again, Cecile. Uh, I'm Denise. I'm from Mexico. I'm an architect, writer, and curator, I guess. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be back at the new center. I was out for some months. Um, I think the last years I was living in the Netherlands. I just moved back to Mexico a couple of months ago. And I think the last years I was working on issues around like labor and immigration and cybernetics. Um, I used to work in the port of Rotterdam in a, like a, like a part-time job in a, uh, like a um, online supermarket. So that was kind of my main research for the last years. And I was really yeah, interesting. So, yeah, like I think I'm really fascinated by like contemporary forms of labor, particularly from post-Fordism. And I think fiction or like developing theories from, or theory fiction from capitalism, I'm, I'm still super interested in that. And I'm, um, yeah, I haven't been back in Mexico in like seven years, so like living. So I'm interested in thinking how can I continue developing this work and maybe more particularly also related with, like, I think I'm interested in these issues of techne or capitalism, but also related with like critical race theory or like, um, yeah. So I think those are the explorations that I'm doing now. Amazing, thank you. Um, Anna? Don't know if she's there or Eduarda? You there? Hi. <clears> hey, <throat> nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, Cecile, and everyone else who also I've seen in other classes. Uh, my name is Eduarda. I'm based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. <clears throat> I am a visual artist and researcher. Currently, I'm making my master's on <clears throat> how uh, there are process of radicalization of the extreme right, far right to, on the far right through means. So my interest in Simondon is exactly <clears throat> with individuation because uh, when we look at Bolsonaro's or Trump's or any of these sorts of memes, we see that they're dealing <clears throat> with deeper questions of subjectivity, of identity. Uh, the whole thing of the red pill is very based on a sort of male reaction uh, to the changes of society. So I'm very curious to see if Simon Don can add uh, something to the sort of cybernetician, uh, right cellars and way that uh, Susan Blackmore brings when looking to memes when she talks about mean plexus and the nature of the subject. I think there are some blind spots on her approach, which is very close to Daniel Dennett. And I think that maybe Simon Don can give another look on how memes are shared or created and consumed and part of our own subjectivity. Wow, that sounds amazing. If I would be actually really interested, all of you, if you have any pieces of writing that you want to send me, I can't promise I'll be able to read them straight away because I've kind of... Um, playing uh, avoidance, uh, avoidance um, game with my deadlines right now, but I, I would really love that. So do do send me your work. And Eduardo, that sounds really fascinating. I'm curious how Simon Dor is going to help you navigate through that. Um, I think Freya said she's not very well, so she wrote her introduction. In fact, it sounds like we all have the same virus everywhere. We, all of us with a kind of a nose <laughs> we're blocked. Ill at the same time, this is virus that doesn't go away, apparently. Um, so Freya said, I'm uh, introducing myself in the chat. I'm hideously ill. I'm a master's student in philosophy and literature, literary sciences from Germany. Big fan of Simon Don. I'm looking particularly forward to connecting his two lessons on animal and on animals and men with his two main theses. So, yeah, that's what the next session is going to be about. So I hope hope not to disappoint there. Um, and uh, I've got Dagmar here. And then because everything swapped around, you have to tell me if I missed, I think, yeah, I, I hope I didn't miss anyone. It's just uh, Dagmar, right? Yes, hi, hi. I'm also hi. 
still, but trying. Uh, and my camera is broken. Sorry about that. Um, uh, my name is Dagmar Moldovanu, and I'm based in Copenhagen. And I studied at Malmö and Malmö Art Academy. And I'm also enrolled in the Art and Curatorial Practices program. I'm a visual artist, and I work with different media such as sculpture and installation and image, sometimes also sound. Um, and I'm interested in subjects like material agency and the inherent properties of different materials, uh, familiar technical objects and industrially made devices and yeah, those objects that shape our everyday experience and their workings. That's amazing. It. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Enrique said uh, Geo, yes. And also, Enrique, by the way, it would be lovely to hear what your background is, even if you're moderating. Um, but uh, Joe, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, I'm Gio Lingo. I'm from the Philippines. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and I'm part of the uh, Transdisciplinary Studies program. I, I just joined last year, I think, September. Um, my project focuses on basically on Filipino violence and terrorism um, in reaction to the passing of uh, the anti-terror law in 2020, which enables uh, the government to re red tag anyone out of mere suspicion, you know, as a terrorist. So yeah, and my project, I have to, I have my projects so, on. I have two projects like building, I'm just building upon this uh, uh, two footages uh, I had when I was like red tag as a terrorist myself when I attended a rally basically. So right now uh, I'm interested in Simon Don because uh, I'm actually uh, researching or exploring uh, nature, you know, in every sense of the word basically and its relation to terrorist or terrorism and violence in general oh uh, interesting because i didn't even get around to the idea of natural law and um yeah the connections with plato and the timaeus the, the idea of yeah good fantastic hopefully hopefully that's something interesting interesting connections also between what you're doing and eduarda is doing uh, you should also write to each other, by the way, when you um, feel that there's connections. But I think you have a possibility of doing that anyway. In the um, there's a forum for that, isn't there? Okay, and, and Enrique, if you you don't you're not obliged, obviously, but it'd be lovely to um, hear what you what your background is. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Enrique. I'm from Brazil. I have a degree in history. I'm a history teacher for little kids and teenagers. Uh, my current research involves uh, money and finance. I'm trying to understand how, uh, or better, in what ways can we perceive money as being something not neutral, or something that is already based on violence and domination. But I'm still in the beginning of this research. Uh, Previous, previously, I was focused quite uh, principally on, on Marxist theory, and I read Capital, I read some other writings of his, and then I, I, for, for some necessity of, for, for the necessity of, of seeing some shortcuts of Marx theory, I started to uh, look, look for uh, other uh, how can I say this? Other reference, right? So that's it. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Thank you for this. Um, I, I think you do you work with Raphael at all? No, no, I, I didn't have the didn't have the chance, but I I, I know. <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, Enrique, I'm, I'm both apologies to you because you're moderating and I've, I've kept you much longer no, than, than the time. No, and um, No problem. Yeah, thank you everybody for, for joining in and I, I hope as a kind of first session, this was a kind of gentle warm up and then um, you're going to enjoy next time. And uh, on uh, the third session, we have uh, 
Mr. Slav, who is going to uh, give a presentation too, because he uh, wrote an amazing essay for one of the other. Um, he moderated one of the other seminars I did for this program, and he also wrote an amazing essay for for one of them. So um, we kind of thought that this would be um, that this would be a very good contribution and. I'm really looking forward to that. And then the last session is going to be tying up loose ends and, and maybe delving into particular concepts that you want to focus on more. So yeah, it's great. Great to meet you all. And I'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.